Olá, a IUPAP, International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, está interessada em muitas coisas. Dentre elas, a definição das unidades básicas que nós usamos no dia a dia, a manutenção das constantes fundamentais, mas também está muito interessada nos desafios que a ciência tem atualmente. Na área da física são muitos os desafios. Nós temos desafios desde o entendimento das partículas elementares, da matéria condensada, na física nuclear, é, na biofísica, na astrofísica. Em todas as áreas, ou sub-áreas da física, nós temos desafios. Para que você saiba quais são esses desafios, a IUPAP organizou um workshop especial que chama-se Entendendo os Desafios da Física Moderna. Cada área da física está aqui é, sendo apresentada por um líder, membro da IUPAP, e que você terá então agora a chance de entender, através desta apresentação, os desafios que a área apresenta e como os físicos, de um modo geral, estão superando esses desafios para que a física seja um instrumento de entendimento das ciências naturais e que auxilie o homem não apenas a avançar o seu conhecimento, mas a tornar a ciência um instrumento útil da melhoria de vida de cada um existente nesse planeta e nesse universo. Assista e também faça parte do entendimento dos desafios da física moderna. Boa sorte! So next talk will be by uh, Professor Siofen Jin and will be magnetism. Okay, I supposed to give a review of the status of magnetism and give the perspective of magnetism in future. And I take it just a kind of a mission impossible. So then I will start with a conference we sponsored just yesterday, and it will happen next year in San Francisco. And the program is not yet in web, but we have the already the plenary talk announced. So we have in total only four plenary speakers and noticeable there's a female speaker. So it's already beyond the goal we try to reach 20%, so it's already 25%. And uh, since there's no program about the next year meeting, and I just uh, uh, take out of this uh, uh, next last one in Barcelona, and you can see that uh, the symposium, topological matters, spin or orbitronics and the skymians, and the biomedical application of magnetic nanoparticles. And then the sessions with the strong correlated electronics uh, system, including superconductivity and the multifluid, and spin system and the magnetic structures, spin electrons, spin transports, and the magnetization dynamics. And then they are all. So for such a broad area, and if I come up with just a review or just a highlight a couple of them, and it's also, I take it as a mission impossible. So in this case, what I'm going to do as a Chinese, and we follow Confucius' lesson, it's a if you don't understand what he said, and in English it's to know it's impossible, but keep on doing it. So now 
I'm going to talk, just tell you a story about the whole effect. And that's the title, of the, uh, it's the whole effect Edwin Hu never imagined. And this, uh, today we have so many Hu effect, but most of them just named after him, and he knew nothing about that. But my talk in the following will concentrate only the discovery he made 130 years ago, but took us such a long time to understand what that meant. And he did the experiment in John Hopkins University, yeah, 130 years ago. And it's a part of uh, my activity this year, IEEE Magnetic Society Distinguished Lecture, so talking about it uh, uh, yeah, worldwide. So this is uh, certainly a milestone for physics, and Edwin Hu published a paper in 1879. And remember, that's before electrons discovered. So he observed this effect and just uh, passing the current this way longitudinally and apply magnetic field perpendicularly. And no matter spin up or spin down, just we turned it around. And that took us a relatively short time to understand it's by the Lorentz force. But one year after he did this experiment on gold and copper, he switched his material from gold copper to ferromagnetic metals, iron, cobalt, nickel. And the surprising thing is actually the effect is one order of magnitude higher, which means you're passing the same current, but the whole voltage is much bigger. So this is called anomalous Hall effect today, or extraordinary Hall effect. And the most striking thing he discovered is the sign of whole voltage for nickel is opposite to that of iron and cobalt. And it's totally weird. So his advisor, Henry Lowland, simply didn't believe that. So you see that uh, he didn't even co-also with the whole. So it's kind of lucky for whole. Otherwise, probably we wouldn't call it whole effect. It's a rolling effect. So anyway, he published that, and he did everything right. So it took us more than 130 years to understand the sign of nickel, anomalous whole effect of nickel, should be and must be opposite to the, uh, that of iron and the cobalt. So that's uh, really interesting. So this is anomalous whole, but in the 50s, and it's already... Uh, kind of understood that it's a spin up to coupling effect uh, rather than Lorentz force. So in this uh, spin up to coupling, the electron passing uh, longitudinally will have the electron just uh, spin up this way and down electron this way. And since for fellow magnetic matter, you have more spin up electron than the down electron. So you get more charge here than here. So that's why you can measure voltage. And uh, this is not uh, useful anomalous whole effect, as far as I know, uh, not really, but uh, at least in this magnetism community or spintronics community, people believe the spin hole effect might be useful. And the spin hole effect is for non magnetic ma ma material, you have equally populated spin up and spin down, and then you wouldn't get any charge accumulation locally. That's why it take us such a long time to realize this spin hole effect. That's, you have to use a non-local measurement. But uh, the, as far as mechanism is concerned, it's exactly the same effect. And you can take a spin hole effect as a special case of anomalous hole effect. So to understand the mechanism of anomalous hole effect is really important. And this, yeah, since it's just a kind of a story, I just tell you, I try to explain why electron moving longitudinally will turn it transversely. And this actually is a pure relativistic effect. When the electron passing in solid, you see many positive ions. But if you sit on top of the electron, 
you see many positive ions moving toward you. And once the positive ion is moving, and it's just electric current. So along the current, there, there will be magnetic fields uh, produced. And remember, it must be inhomogeneous magnetic field. So just a similar, remember that the electron not only has the charge, but also spin of magnetic moment. So exactly similar to the stern gallagher experiment, and the electron moving in this inhomogeneous field were just attended transversely. And the, the electron going the right side is turning this way because the magnetic field is pointing up, and the electron turning from the left also is turning this way because the magnetic field is pointing down. So this is basically the hand-waving picture, and the rest of them just a quantity. Uh, quantitative analysis. I just mentioning, it was a Kapras Lettinger in 1954 proposed the first mechanism, and they say that it's an intrinsic mechanism in the sense that you have a periodic lattice and you take a spin after coupling in, into account. Without any impurity, you should get anomalous velocity along this position, and thanks to uh, Professor Chen Yu and his former student uh, from UT Austin, and they, can, they reformulated this anomalous velocity found by Kaplan's Lattinger in the modern Barry phase language. So once you get this Barry curvature, and you can just uh, uh, get this uh, anomalous whole conductivity calculated every initially. So nowadays, if you have, uh, you give me the lattice, structure, and then you tell me what's the material, I can tell you what's the anomalous whole conductivity. And once you get the, there, and you get the scaling uh, established, it's uh, proportional, anomalous whole resistivity should be proportional to longitudinal resistivity square, and with a constant, just uh, this very curvature uh, contribution. So, but uh, one year later, and 15 years later, uh, Smith and Bourdieu arg argued that uh, this anomalous whole effect must be an extrinsic effect. It must be coming from the impurity. And but Smith argued that with this skill scattering mechanism, it should be linear um, uh, relation. But the Berger argued that besides the skill scattering, one should also expect a quadratic turn. So then, since then, in, in literature, people just have two terms. And the ones, this one, called the skill scattering. And this one is not clear that it's intrinsic or extrinsic. It's so controversy, and I ch should give you the flavor how controversy. So this is a quite a famous paper in our community. This is a spin hole effect. But this also, Hirsch is now better known by, by his H index. Sandra just mentioned a lot of times about H index is actually from Hirsch. So in this paper, he said that, okay, it uh, should be uh, skill scaling and side jump. And uh, as in the early days, also intrinsic proposed, but it's not true. And in this uh, quite well known in our community textbook, and it's also mentioned skill scaling and side jump and without even mentioning this uh, uh, intrinsic. So this, on the one side, people believe it's a purely extrinsic effect, but if you look at the paper by Nagasa, uh, Sinova, Alan McDonough, and those theoretician, in the abstract, it's uh, clearly say that in concert with the first principle calculation, and it's uh, strongly favor the dominance of this intrinsic mechanism. And another paper also in the same year of 2010, Review of Modern Physics by Chen Yu and his collaborator, also saying strongly favored by the bar uh, intrinsic and more explicit, say, which leaves little room for side jump. So, and there's another paper by Sadamichi and his collaborator in 2013, and it's in the abstract, it's clearly say that side jump, even if it's existing, and it's irrelevant for spin tronics, only the intrinsic is important. So you see, this is a kind of a, a controversy after Edwin Hall found this effect 130 years ago, it's still arguing which one is more important. So that's our uh, contribution. 
And remember that all the theoretical model is just based on one kind of impurity in a pure, pure periodic back, uh, lattice background. But in real material, we have at least the lattice imperfection and the phonon contribution for the resistivity. So the key question to be asked is this scaling should go not only with this one, probably also with this one and with this one. Then uh, I don't want to go the detail, just tell you that uh, we, are, yeah, we adopted the approach quite different from the traditional one. We are using the finite size effect of the residue resistivity as a function of film thickness. And this way, uh, we actually, phenomenologically, we establish the scaling with three terms. And this is a skill scaling actually is only related to low XX0, not total resistivity. And this is a side jump low XX0 square. And this is a barrier curvature term. So once you have this scaling established, you can convert it to conductivity length. And this is a, can be calculated every initially. So this is a, for all the different film thickness, we Low temperature data could be anywhere, it's a fan-like, but when the temperature increases to about room temperature, it's merging to a kind of a universal point. And this value around 1,000 is this intrinsic contribution. And we look up, yeah, okay, I have more, in, more than enough time. <laughs> okay, so uh, when, when you look up uh, this old literature, this idea did in 1960, with uh, uh, iron single crystal called iron whisker. That's the best iron single crystal sample. And the room temperature data is also here. So this point has some universal property. It's only related for its uh, uh, bulk property. And another interesting thing is we noticed when we published our paper, and there's another paper from uh, Tokola's group in University of Tokyo. And they were talking about uh, doping silicon in iron, and because you tune the defect, so they have the title of extrinsic effect. But uh, we're just uh, using their raw data and plot it in our way. And again, the low data for low temperature data for 1% of silicon is starting from here, 300 K is here. And 0.3% of silicon. Uh, low temperature data here and the high temperature data here. And they, they actually collapse on top of each other. And you, if you try to see what's the intercept, again, it's 1,000. So this is a kind of a strong evidence. This intercept is the barrier curvature, or it's the intrinsic contribution for this. And so when we published this paper, we did with this iron, but later on we also checked with Nico and the Kobo did the same thing. And we can, with all our modern facility, we basically just reproduce the report, the result Edwin Hall did 130 years ago. So this Kobo with intercept around here, but it's positive. But the nickel is indeed negative at the backside. So that was a very uh, interesting observation. But nowadays, with the uh, initial calculation, and you can confirm this is just a pure electronic band structure result. And any graduate student can confirm that cobalt and iron have this barrier curvature positive, and the nickel has a negative. So this is. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the actually, when we publish that paper, we already noticed in thicker film, there's some curving happening. That was a little bit puzzling. And we did a better job with another system. It's better high quality sample. So this curving is really getting more and more significant. So this is a point we start to have the collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Chen Yu, and uh, you see that once you treat the data, subtract the skill scattering, and the plot as a sigma xx 
over sigma x is zero, and they all collapse on top of each other. So that means there is some universality uh, within. So that's the theory for the first time. You can treat the defect in equal foot, not only one, but multiple. And uh, I won't go to the detail, but then you just uh, uh, calculate the conductivity with the Feynman diagram. And the final theoretical result actually is these two lines. And the three terms we phenomenologically already established, but now you, got, you find the theoretical justification it should be there. And this is a crossover term. This is cause the deviation of the data. So this is a part actually turned out it's determined by this theoretical result. So yeah, we uh, collaborated together and we found this uh, yeah, uh, five minutes. I will save some time for others. So now I'm already back to my almost conclusion. So these all the students contributed, and uh, there are also two female students uh, counted. It's also more than 25%. So, so the final conclusion, after 130 years of Edwin Hu did the experiment in John Hopkins, and finally we understand it, not only which one is more important. Actually, all the intrinsic and the extrinsic, they are all important, and it's, you just tell which condition, and one or another will be dominating. So this is the final slide. Thank you very much. OK, so we open now for questions and comments. We have time. I don't see. Okay, if not, we, we thank the speaker again.